I have an unusual sermon, unusual subject, and I can't be sure. In fact, I don't know why I feel compelled to deal with this. My subject is mysterious reasons for suffering. And there are two scriptures that I want to start out with. The first, Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. When Paul says, I rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I am completing in my flesh what is lacking in Christ's sufferings for his body, that is, the church. And then 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Well, may God be pleased to bless the reading and the preaching of this, his most holy and infallible word. Brief word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray now for the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus by your Spirit to rest upon every mind in this place in order that their perception of what I say will be received as you intend. Cleanse my tongue that I will be your transparent vehicle to pass on everything that needs to be said, nothing that doesn't need to be said. Help me to be very, very clear, very, very simple. May this be a life-changing word and a word that brings great honor and glory to your name. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you received a letter from a prisoner, you've never met him, he's a man in prison who writes you and wants to give you advice, would you listen to him? I think you'd be in doubt whether you should do a thing like that. Well, what you may not realize is that the Apostle Paul has never met the Colossians. And yet he's writing a letter to them and refers to himself as their apostle. It's not that he was exactly their apostle because he had not been to that part of, of the Mediterranean. As a matter of fact, uh, a person by the name of Epaphras started the church. He was a soul winner. He was an unusual man that led many to Christ. And yet they needed an apostle and Paul felt it was his duty to be their apostle, but he's in prison. And he gives us this letter of Colossians, which, for what it's worth, is possibly the most difficult book in the New Testament. And this is one of the most difficult verses in that particular book. And yet I feel compelled to deal with it, and I hope I can be very clear. Now, Paul was self-conscious of his circumstances. He said to Timothy, do not be ashamed of me, a prisoner. And sometimes we have to share in the stigma of a fellow Christian who needs our support and encouragement. Now, Paul accepted suffering because he was told in advance that he would. Not before he was a Christian, because he didn't expect to be saved. As a matter of fact, he was converted on the road to Damascus. He was not on his way to a prayer meeting. He was on his way to kill Christians, and God struck him down. And then it was told to Ananias, go tell Paul how much he must suffer for my sake. Now, the interesting thing about suffering as a Christian, we find out about it later. It's a post-conversion discovery. And Paul now <laughs> says something very strange. He said, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And then he goes on to say that they should suffer. He says, I'm completing in my flesh what is lacking. I rejoice in my sufferings for you. Now, I want us to see some things about suffering that I hope will make a difference in your life 
from now on. Three points. First, predestination and suffering. Now, don't be afraid of the word predestination. But this is something that we find out is our inheritance. Now, there are many reasons I could give for suffering. They're in the New Testament. But I want to share what I think are two mysterious reasons for suffering. Now, here's the interesting thing. As I said, you don't know usually in advance uh, that you're going to be suffering. Uh, as a matter of fact, Paul said to the Philippians, Philippians 1 verse 30, it is given to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe, but also to suffer. And so now they find out. You may hear some of the Philippians saying, thanks a lot for telling us. They were not given that advice in advance. And same way with the Thessalonians. He said it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6, you know that you were predestined for these things. Well, I don't know whether they all knew that, but it's something we find out later. And Paul could actually say, I rejoice. Now, it's so interesting. You think, well, I'm not rejoicing. It's good for you to say, Paul, but I don't feel like rejoicing at all. But the thing is, it's part of the package. Now, there are some things we are not supposed to figure out. We're all curious about why this happened. Why would God allow suffering in the first place? That's the question that will not be answered until God clears his name at the final judgment. You say, does God need to clear his name? Well, he's the most maligned and hated person in the universe, God the Father. Because everybody blames God for everything, and God makes no attempt to explain himself. But there will be a day when he'll explain everything. But in the meantime, take some advice from what happened when Moses saw this burning bush. He saw a bush on fire. He kept looking at it, and the bush didn't burn up. He kept burning, the bush didn't burn up. And Moses said, that's odd. So he said, I'm going to figure out what's going on. So he heads for the bush to figure it out, and God says, stop. Stop. Don't come any closer. Take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. And here's what we should learn. There are some things God doesn't want us to figure out. But we just stop. And we worship. And let God be God. And don't demand that he explain himself. And so that's what I mean by predestination and suffering. Don't try to figure out. In James chapter 1 verse 2. He says rejoice Count it pure joy when you fall into all kinds of trials. You think, well, if we should count it all joy for suffering, well, let's go out and look for some more suffering so we can have more joy. Now, don't do that. It'll come soon enough. But here's the condition. In order to count it pure joy, he says, when we fall into it, it's very important to remember you don't manipulate it, you don't manufacture it, you don't make it happen, but when you just fall into it, and you did nothing to make it happen, and you realize you're in the middle of a trial, maybe a great trial, then it is allowable to say, this is something I should rejoice in, because you didn't make it happen. You see, it's something that God was behind. One of the main things we should learn about the book of Job, and that's a book that deals with suffering, is that God initiated the suffering with Job. Many remember that, well, the devil caused it. You forget, God started it. 
God said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Well, that lets you know that if you are in a trial, and I couldn't help but think that there may be one person that you, as I speak, are in the middle of the greatest trial of your whole life. You're in it right now. This sermon is for you. Would God actually do this for me? Oh, yes. See, the rest that are not in your greatest trial, take note of this, because the day may come that you need to understand if you're in a severe trial that you didn't make happen, but you fell into it, you qualify, and God says, count it all a joy. Now, this does not make sense at first, and it never does. But I feel that God has led me to say something that will make a difference in someone here tonight in your greatest trial. But I come to the second point, the purpose of suffering. Why would God allow something like this? Well, there are two things that I want us to show, I want to show you, I want us to see. Mysterious reasons. The first is this comment by Paul in verse 24. He said, I rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I am completing in my flesh what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for his body, that is, the church. Now, at first glance, you think, wait a minute. Does that mean that Christ didn't suffer enough, that somebody has to complete it? No. Christ suffered all that can be imagined in his own body. But Paul is referring to the body of Christ, the church. That's you. And so it has been designed by God that we share in Christ's sufferings. And there is a quota. It's very interesting. God is looking for people who will suffer and not complain. And there's a quota given in the body of Christ. You're invited to enter into this, but I can announce that there's space available <laughs> because not many are interested in this. And then when they do find themselves in suffering, they complain, 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 and complain. And finally, the trial ends, and they just say, Whew, glad that's over. When the truth is, there's a better way to look at it. And God is looking for those who will fill up the sufferings of Christ in the body of Christ, in his body. And so let me put it like this. Suppose your bank, the manager, writes to you and says to you, uh, you've got money allocated to you, uh, but you must come down here and pick it up. You've got to identify yourself, because if you don't take it, we're going to give it to somebody else. I think you would go. It's this with suffering. There is a quota, a quota given, and for those who will accept it and be grateful, you'll find it is the best thing that has ever happened to you. So when it comes to the purpose of sufferings, the first thing is that there is a whole design behind it that you're filling up what was lacking, because there are churches all over where the people are rejecting suffering. They don't want to have anything to do with it. They just complain. And then sometimes they end up just challenging God, and then they hate God that you've allowed this. Now, what's interesting is that non-Christians suffer, 
They have their problems. COVID affected everybody. And so those that are not saved, they have suffering, except in their case, it does not mount to anything. But with the Christian, when you are given suffering, it's a privilege because it's going to turn into something so wonderful that the non-Christian could never experience. So in order to qualify, it is that you dignify the trial instead of complain about it. And so, so much suffering has been allocated to the body of Christ, a certain quantity. So, that's the first thing that Paul is saying to you. You would not have known that that's what suffering is doing. But then there's a second thing. Some years ago, I invited Joseph Tone to preach at Westminster Chapel. You probably wouldn't know that he's the man that changed my life, teaching me total forgiveness. He's a man from Romania who suffered in the days when they called it behind the Iron Curtain. And uh, Joseph Son happens to, to be alive today in Portland, Oregon. I talked to him the other day on the phone. He's older than I am. He's blessed me. But I invited him to preach at Westminster Chapel, and he gave what I think was the most profound sermon I've ever heard in my whole life. And that he spoke on the subject, and that's where I get the title, Mysterious Reasons for Suffering. And that the reason Job was suffering was partly because God wanted to demonstrate to the angels who were watching what would happen to a man who loved God and had everything but lost it all. And so Satan said, he will curse you to your face if you let me have a hand in it. And then God says, you can have a hand in it, but you can only go so far. And now the angels were watching, for never before had there been a case like this, when a man who had never sinned, in the sense of what people, people would call sin, he was upright, he was flawless, God was pleased with him, and he had everything. What would happen? The angels wanted to see to a man like that who lost it all. In the case of Job, it started out good. The things that began to happen, he didn't complain. In fact, he said that beautiful statement, the Lord gives, us, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. And his wife said, why don't you curse God? Because it already, the suffering was horrible. And then more suffering came, and more came, added by what are called th three friends. You've heard the expression with friends like that, who needs an enemy? Well, that's the kind of friends they had, and they could not get it out of their minds that a person who hadn't sinned would suffer like this, because it was the theology of Israel that sin and suffering go together. If you've suffered, it's because God is getting even with you for something. And the truth is, Job had not sinned, and all their accusations were false, but they continued on and on and on until finally Job caved in and a different kind of sin emerged that hadn't been considered, and it's called self-righteousness. And Job became so self-righteous that he now looked bad after all. At the end of the book of Job, God steps in, and in Job chapter 42, verse 1, the bottom line of the book of Job what Job learned, he says, now I know that God can do anything, 
and that no purpose of his can be thwarted. Now, this is what you need to remember. If you are in a trial, there'll be a good outcome if you don't give up and if you persevere and you wait. The question you may ask then, well, what kind of suffering? Well, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul gives five possibilities. Five possibilities. He says in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 10, I take pleasure. That means he's not complaining. He's learned to accept it. God has a purpose in it. Instead of saying, God, how dare you do this to me? Paul said, I take pleasure in, of all things, weaknesses. He boasts of his weakness. Most people boast of their strength. Paul says, I am weak. They think he's playing games, but he's not joking. And he tells them how weak. And I wonder if there's anybody here uh, who could qualify for having a weakness. Anybody here with a weakness? Any hands up? Well, I see there are people here with a weakness. You see, the King James Version calls it infirmity. See, what may be my weakness may not be yours. What may be yours may not be mine. But we all have a weakness. And we suffer because of it. And Paul says this is grounds for rejoicing. He's boasting in his weakness. And instead of feeling there's no hope for you because you have this particular weakness, understand that we have at the right hand of God a high priest who is touched with the feeling of our weakness. And you may think, I can't pray. I can never get close to God because I've got this weakness and and, and he won't have anything to do with me. I can tell you that weakness, if you won't complain, but understand that God understands that, can be what can endear you to him. You see, you wouldn't want to tell what your weakness is because you're afraid that someone would say to you, you have that? Get away from me. I don't want to be around you. So you don't tell anybody what your weakness is. I wouldn't want to tell you mine. I'm afraid you would say, oh, I didn't think you would have a weakness like that. But he he actually says, I accept my weakness. He says, I take pleasure in weaknesses. In fact, he was so weak, as he says at the end of chapter 11, instead of facing those who were wanting to kill me, they let me down with a basket so I wouldn't have to face it. He said, I should have faced it. That's how weak I am. And he lets you know, the great apostle Paul has this weakness. And you see, the weakness came out with Job, and they wanted to complain. And they said to him, there's sin in your life. But then the self-righteousness emerged, and now... Job said, I had sin that I didn't realize I had. And one of the purposes of suffering is that you might see what you're really like and you find that God loves you just the same. What else? He says, weakness. In verse 10, insults. He says, I take pleasure in insults. Anybody here been insulted lately? Do you know what it is for somebody to say something rude to you? Something said about you where they're wanting to put you down? Do you know what it's like? That person wants to destroy you. They want to tell things about you that will make you look bad. Well, Paul said, I take pleasure in it. And so it can be part of fulfilling the suffering in the body of Christ. And whereas it hurt at first, but you think, would God allow me to have this? And not only weaknesses, he goes on, 
Weaknesses, insults, hardships. Oh, what could that be? Financial hardship. Physical hardship. Things just don't go right. And it's just hard. Paul said to Timothy, endure hardness. And you think, well, I thought being a Christian would make it easy. It's not easy. And if you won't complain, but if you just accept it, you're going to find out that God has as a secret weapon, weapon, maybe something up his sleeve, he's going to show you how that God will use that. And you think, oh, this is too good to be true. I said there would be five. What's number four? First, weakness, insult, hardship, persecution. I heard it said tonight that when you are saved, there's a target in your back. And so that's true with all Christians. And I want you to know you have an enemy. The moment that you cross over into the Christian faith, you now have a new enemy, the devil. And he's after you. You were perhaps not told before you got saved. Sometimes they are, but oftentimes you're given the message, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And you're not told until after you're a Christian. It's a post conversion discovery. And you find out you're going to be persecuted. As for the Apostle Paul, his suffering was so great when you consider all that he had gone through. And uh, he says in chapter 11, he's gone through toil and hardship, sleep, sleepless nights. Surely Paul didn't have trouble sleeping. Well, he does. He says so. Do you have sometimes trouble sleeping? And you pray to God and it doesn't seem to get you anywhere? Paul says, I know what that's like. He says, hunger and thirst without food, cold and without clothing. And so, when it comes to the suffering, it could be anything. The issue is how you take it. Whether you accept it. Whether you get angry with God or just say, Lord, I don't understand it. But it's okay. It's okay. One of my heroes was Marian Anderson, the African-American contralto who had a voice that Arturo Toscanini said comes around once in a hundred years. And I went to hear her sing in the, in the auditorium in Washington where she'd been refused because of the color of her skin. And she sang for the first time publicly and I happened to be there and I never will forget the song. I told Jesus it would be all right if he changed my name, changed my name. Jesus told me I would have to be humble if he changed my name. Change my name. Jesus told me that the world would hate me if he changed my name. Change my name. Jesus told me that I would suffer if he changed my name. Changed my name. I told Jesus it would be all right if he changed my name, changed my name. And that's what God is asking of you. Will it be all right? If you suffer, the world would hate you. And then he just adds one other word, difficulties. Whatever could that be? Whatever is difficult. It's not easy. In other words, what we're seeing here, the suffering that may come, it's not necessarily just because you're being persecuted for giving out the gospel. 
any kind of suffering because put little things in your path. Jesus said, if you suffer for my sake. Jesus said, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And so when the little things come, the little things come and you accept them, then God may say, you're on schedule for another trial. But now what's it all for? And I come now. The thing I want you to see, it's so important, the privilege of suffering. You say, I, I can't imagine. Here's what's interesting. Well, Paul is in prison when he's writing this letter. <laughs> he's in prison in a dismal prison in Rome. I've been there. It's dark. He's in chains. He can't even move very much. And he says, I'm rejoicing. You think, this man's crazy. Oh, because of the compensation. And he's not feeling sorry for the Colossians. This is interesting. When you think of your child having to go through suffering, you feel sorry for them, and that's understandable. But when Paul could talk to these Colossians, he says, I rejoice in my sufferings for you because he knows that if they will accept this, the day will come, the day will come that you will be so thankful. So Paul is looking ahead. I can tell you, I've lived long enough to say that every trial I've ever had, and I mean the worst, the worst thing that ever happened to me. I can't tell you the details, but I can tell you it was horrible. I can say to you under a lie detector, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. But I didn't know that at the time. I didn't know that at the time. And you see, at first, you'd hate to see your new converts suffer. The person that I baptized, first of all, at Westminster Chapel, he was a Los Angeles Jewish businessman, never heard the gospel in his life. He had a secretary in London who asked him to come to Westminster Chapel. I didn't know about it for months, but he came and was converted that night. And he and I became friends later. I took him fishing. He took me out doing a different kind of fishing. And uh, it was a wonderful friendship. But he said something that will shock you in a Key Largo restaurant. This is a quotation. This is, I'm not making this up verbatim. He said, before I was, became a Christian, I was a happy man. Imagine having this man, his name was Jay, give his testimony just before a Billy Graham service and say, before Billy Graham preaches, we want Jay to give his testimony. And he says, well, before I became a Christian, I was a happy man. And everybody's going to say, well, I think I can't wait to be a Christian now. He wasn't complaining. He wasn't complaining. You see, his wife wouldn't convert. His son wouldn't convert. His business associates wouldn't convert. I come now to the privilege of suffering because I can tell you, if you will dignify the trial instead of complain and murmur, you have no idea what is down the road for you. You have no idea. And so I think of Acts chapter 5, verse 41. This is an account where Peter and John were before the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of the Jews. And they said to him, don't you ever again speak in the name of Jesus. We don't want to hear about it. And they beat them. They beat Peter and John. And then says, get out of here. And you know, I can imagine 
inside the uh, room where the Sanhedrin met, I can imagine that they're all saying to themselves, well, we taught them a lesson. We won't have to worry about them again. Would you like to know how they took it? In Acts chapter 5, it's a verse, that sometimes I can't read it without coming to tears. Listen to this. Acts 5, 41. And so, when they came away from the Sanhedrin, Peter and John were rejoicing that they were counted worthy to be treated shamefully on behalf of the name of Jesus. In other words, Peter and John, they couldn't believe their luck. They were pinching themselves. They said, can you believe it? We're getting to suffer for the name of Jesus. Because they were given a second chance. A few weeks before, Peter denied knowing Jesus. And then when the rooster crowed, Jesus looked at Peter, and Peter looked at Jesus, and he wept bitterly. He said, I'm, I'm so sorry. He was so ashamed. And maybe there's someone here. You have let God down. You've let the Lord down. And that's the way Peter felt. John was in the same group because since they all forsake Jesus. Now, they get a second chance. And they're beaten. And they're leaving the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer the shame of his name. And I wonder, could it be, you've let the Lord down, and he's given you a second chance, and he's going to see if, how you'll take it this time. And maybe you've felt deep guilt over the months or however long it's been since you let the Lord down, and you think, Lord, give me another chance to show that I will follow you. I won't be ashamed of you. And so... This is what we learn, that God will give you that chance. And I think that tonight, he's asking someone, this time, if any kind of suffering comes, and I've given you five possible categories, will you complain, or will you just say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. You're not excited about it. Well, Peter and John, maybe they looked like they were. I think you have to be there. But they had such a sense of the presence of God that they just couldn't believe their luck that they got to suffer for the shame of his name. And you see, here is what Paul is saying to these Colossians. <laughs> They've never met him. He hasn't met them. He says... You've been chosen to suffer for the Lord. Many would say, I don't want it. But as Moses learned at the burning bush, there's some things, don't try to figure them out. When James could say, count it pure joy. When you fall into all kinds of trials, it means the fact that you fell into it, you didn't make it happen. See, God had said to the devil behind your back, have you considered my servant Chooks, Jerry, Bill, Patrick? This is not a prophecy that something's going to happen to you. <laughs> but I just want you to know that the suffering. Don't, don't say, look what the devil's done. Yes, he's, he's got a target, but God is sovereign. Nothing happens without his permission. And so the fact that he would think of you in this way, it is an honor. And that's the way Peter and John felt. My mother who died when I was 17, and she was only 43, tells a story about a 90-year-old lady back in Springfield, Illinois, where she was from. By the way, my wife is from Illinois. I'm from Kentucky. You see, Louise, she thinks 
Well, I'm a, I'm a Kentucky hillbilly. Louise is a snob. She's from northern Illinois. She thinks she's a cut above me. Uh, somebody. I, my mother was from Springfield, Illinois. She told her this 90-year-old lady who had talked to the teenagers. And one day she made a statement that nobody ever forgot. She said, I've been a Christian so long now that I can hardly tell the difference between a blessing and a trial. As this hymn, like a river glorious, put it, every joy or trial falleth from above. Yes. It could be that Times Square Church down the road is going to make an impact on this city and this nation. I think God has raised up Timothy Delina for such a time as this. And I believe a great move of the Spirit is coming. I'm saying it may not be easy. And are you prepared to say, Lord, I will follow you. If you don't have it, okay. But this is a message I felt compelled to bring. And the truth is, it takes some time. Dignifying the trial isn't easy. You know, there was a, a Baptist missionary who was a missionary in Africa for 40 years. And after 40 years, he felt it was time to retire. And so he, he sent word back home. He said, uh, my wife and I have decided to retire and we'll be coming into New York City on a certain date. And so he was on a ship that came from Africa to New York. When he got near New York City and the ship was anchoring into the harbor, they heard music. It was a band, a band playing. And he said to his wife, they shouldn't have done anything like this for us. Oh, and he was so excited. They shouldn't have done this for us. They shouldn't have done this for us. And, and so he was ready to get off the ship. He was first in the queue to go down the gangplank. This was back in around 1912. It happened that President Theodore Roosevelt was also on the ship. He had been game hunting in Africa for two weeks. Now he's coming home, and the band was for him. And when the man was to get the missionary to get off, he was going to be first off. And a policeman said, stay there, sir. You can't move. They let the president off first. As it turns out, the old missionary was last off the ship because they made him go down a different way. When he got down to the level, he put his suitcases down. He looked around. Not a soul there to greet him. He and his wife make their way th three blocks over to a second-rate hotel. He falls on his knees. He says, Lord, I serve you for 40 years. I come home, and there's nobody here. President Roosevelt game hunts for two weeks. He comes home, and a band plays. And at that moment, the Holy Spirit whispered to him, but you're not home yet.
Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. So if you're not a Christian, you're going to have all kinds of problems. They won't amount to anything. They will mean nothing. But to those who are saved and will dignify the trial, it's all a matter of whether you're in the family and you're invited to be in the family. Do you know for sure that if you were to die today, would you go to heaven? Do you? If you were to stand before God, you will. And he were to ask you, he might why should I let you into my heaven, whatever would you say? What comes to your mind right now? I talked to a, a flight attendant recently. I said, what would you say to God? He says, why should I let you in? And she said, uh, I've been a pretty good person. See, that kind of answer is typical. If it didn't come to your mind to say, because Jesus died for me on the cross, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes. You may be trusting good things you've done, good works, your baptism, your church membership. That won't save you. If you don't know for sure that you would go to heaven if you died, I want you to pray this prayer. You don't need to say it out loud. But just say it in your heart. God will see you. Pray this, Lord Jesus, I need you, I want you, I'm sorry for my sins, wash my sins away by your blood, I welcome your Holy Spirit into my heart, as best as I know how, I give you my life. That's it. Did you pray that prayer? Did you? Are you ashamed that you prayed that prayer? Why do you ask, R.T.? Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. I'm going to ask you to do something that may take a little courage. You hadn't counted on this. But if you prayed that prayer... I'm going to ask you in the next 10 seconds to show that you're not ashamed and just stand up. You say, in front of all these people? Yep, in front of everybody. Just stand. If you prayed that prayer right now, just stand. Anyone else? Yes, yes. It's a beautiful sight. It's a beautiful sight. Now, stay standing for just a second. It's possible that some standing, you were saved before tonight, that's possible, but you heard the gospel and you wanted to stand. You did no harm, that was fine. But if you've never prayed a prayer like that before, and you've just confessed him, do you know what just happened to you? You've just been born again. Congratulations. <laughs>